The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. But baseball has marked the time. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors and let you know there will be spoilers ahead. Today on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on Field of Dreams 1989. I'm reviewing this movie as a small tribute to Ray Liotta, who passed from this life on May 26, 2022, at the too young age of 67. Classic people, I sure could use a couple of new reviews. Your support is greatly appreciated. This movie, along with another directed by Costner, Dances with Wolves, 1990, has been listed on the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, and aesthetically important. This movie, which makes me cry, has a pitiful 7.5 rating on imdb.com. It should be a lot higher. On RottenTomatoes.com, the film has an 87% on the tomato meter and 86% audience approval. That's closer to how it should be. New York Times film critic Karen James wrote in an April 21st, 1989 review, quote, Kevin Costner as an Iowa farmer named Ray Kinsella looks across his cornfield and sees a vision that glimmers like a desert mirage. On a blazing bright baseball field are men in old-time white uniforms, translucent as ghosts. The short route that has led to this point in Field of Dreams goes to the heart of a work so smartly written, so beautifully filmed, so perfectly acted that it does the almost impossible trick of turning sentimentality into true emotion. Before envisioning the field, Ray has heard a distinct, spectral voice saying, If you build it, he will come. While he is puzzling out the voice's meaning, Ray walks into the kitchen and catches on television a glimpse of James Stewart in Harvey, explaining that he has heard the voice of a six-foot-tall white rabbit. The man is sick, he tells his young daughter, not knowing that his own six-foot-tall white apparitions are on their way. Field of Dreams is an idealistic film that treasures America's icons, baseball, the farmland, Jimmy Stewart heroes, even the 1960s, and carries their emotional weight into the 1980s. Mr. Costner does not make one false move. When he hits some balls to shoeless Joe Jackson, he is boyish enough to grin, nervous enough to hit the ball so it lands at his own feet, adult enough to try and act calm. He says, I am pitching to shoeless Joe Jackson with restrained excitement rather than sappy wonder. There are moments when Field of Dreams goes over the edge, indulging in rhapsodic, excessive dialogue from the novel. Mr. Jones gives a long, unnecessary speech that states bluntly what the film is about. This field, this team, is a part of our past, Ray, he says. It reminds us of what was good and what can be again. It's a Capra-esque speech, dropped whole, without modern revision, into a 1980s film. But even when the film loses its balance, Field of Dreams leaves little room for ambivalent. Audiences will probably believe in Mr. Costner's illusion or not, love or hate this film. It seems much easier to fall into Field of Dreams than to resist its warm, intelligent, timely appeal to our most idealistic selves, unquote. Wow. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. The fantastic actor Burt Lancaster takes the role of Dr. Archibald Moonlight Graham, a man that has a second chance to change his life. This great actor was first covered in the Crossbar Motel film Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962. I was surprised to see Ann Seymour pop up as the newspaper publisher in Chisholm. This actress was first covered as the long-suffering wife of the king in All the King's Men, 1949. Kevin Costner plays 1960s liberal and current corn farmer Ray Kinsella. Costner was born in 1955 in California. He was from a modest background with his father working for an electrical company and his mother was a welfare worker. Costner graduated from high school in Villa Park, California in 1973. He then attended California State University at Fullerton, majoring in business. Costner was also studying acting. He worked in marketing until a chance meeting with Richard Burton convinced him to try acting full-time. 
Costner moved to Hollywood where he worked odd jobs such as Disney River Cruise operator, truck driver, tour guide to the stars, and working on a fishing boat. His first film was a soft porn called Malibu Hot Summer 1981. Costner made a decision to only work in mainstream films from then on. Costner first appeared on my radar with The Big Chill 1983. Wait, was he in that film? Yes. In fact, he was the dead friend Alex that they had all come to bury. All his scenes, except for the dressing of the body in the casket, were cut from the film. Costner gets beat up for many of his films and has gotten more than a few Razzies. However, I like just about everything he has ever done, except the water movie. Costner appeared in the modern western Silverado 1985 and was pretty impressive as the young gunman. This movie was followed by American Flyers 1985, a tale of bicycle racing and families, The Untouchables 1987, which I feel is a genuinely great modern police procedural, and it has Sean Connery. No Way Out 1987, a terrific story of espionage. Bull Durham 1988, one of the funniest baseball films ever. Field of Dreams 1989, the subject of today's review. The Costner directed Dances with the Wolves 1990, that won the Best Picture and Best Director Oscars, as well as five others. JFK 1991, the less said the better. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 1991, which was really good and had Alan Rickman as a villain. The Bodyguard, 1992. I'm still not sure what that was about. Wyatt Earp, 1994. Not as good as Tombstone, 1993. Waterworld, 1995. I hated it. Tin Cup, 1996. Off the charts funny and up there with Caddyshack, 1980. The Post-Apocalypse, The Postman, 1997. I thought it was great. For the Love of the Game, 1999. 13 Days, 2000, where Costner showed the Kennedy brothers how to handle the Russians, and yet a good movie. Open Range, 2003. A gritty and very good western. The Upside of Anger, 2005. Draft Day 2014. McFarlane USA 2015, where he teaches disadvantaged Mexican-Americans long-distance running, Hidden Figures 2016, and The Highwaymen 2019. Costner also directed The Postman 1997 and Open Range 2003. I would be most remiss if I didn't mention Costner's work on television's Yellowstone 2018-2022. to It's excellent and over-the-top with violence in the modern era. This show also has some fair to Midland spinoffs. Ray Liotta played the ghost of Shoeless Joe Jackson, allegedly one of the greatest baseball players to ever live. Liotta was born in New Jersey in 1954. He was adopted from an orphanage when he was six months old. His parents owned a chain of automotive stores. Liotta attended Union High School before studying acting at the University of Miami. Liotta began working in television movies and series in 1980. This continues until he was successful in Something Wild, 1986. The industry immediately wanted to cast Leota in more over-the-top roles. The actor instead chose to be in Dominic and Eugene, 1988. Good performances led him to be cast in Field of Dreams, 1989. He was now a star. Leota worked to get the role of Henry Hill in Goodfellas, 1990, making him a superstar in the gangster genre. If you haven't seen it, Stop listening now and go watch it, but come back. Leota was in Article 99, 1992, Unlawful Entry, 1992, where he was super creepy as a cop who tried to steal Kurt Russell's wife, played by Madeline Stowe. Operation Dumbo Drop, 1995, which I thought was going to bring Disney to its knees. I mean, I was shorting the stock. It turned out to be an excellent, fun movie with a lot of big stars. Unforgiven, 1996, Blow, 2001, Hannibal, 2001, Narc, 2002, Wild Hogs, 2007, where Leota had just the right amount of crazy and a special dad, and Marriage Story, 2019. As I said earlier, we were shocked by the early death of Leota in May 2022. He will be missed. Amy Madigan plays the co-owner of the cornfield, Annie Kinsella. Madigan was born in Chicago in 1950. Her father was a political talking head often seen on television. 
She graduated high school in Chicago before getting a philosophy degree from Marquette University. At some point, she studied acting with Lee Strasberg. Madigan began getting television, movies, and series roles in 1981. Her first film role came in 1983. However, she was not well noticed until the release of Streets of Fire 1984. This movie showed a fantasy world of rock and motorcycles with many big stars. Madigan had another big release that year with the Depression-era farming story Places in the Heart 1984. During the making of this film, she dated and eventually married actor Ed Harris. Madigan went on to make nine movies with her husband. Some of Madigan's other movies are Alamo Bay 1985, Field of Dreams 1989, the great John Candy comedy Uncle Buck 1989, playing the long-suffering girlfriend of Buck, The Dark Half, 1993, Needful Things, 1993, Riders of the Purple Sage, 1996, Pollock, 2000, Just a Dream, 2002, Winter Passing, 2005, Gone Baby Gone, 2007, Frontier, 2014, and Rules Don't Apply, 2016. James Earl Jones played Terrence Mann, a type of J.D. Salinger character with a tie to baseball. Of course, Jones is from my home state. He was born in 1931 in Arca Butler, Mississippi. That's a real place name. Jones was the son of actor Robert Earl Jones, who played Luther in The Sting, 1973. Jones studied acting and speech to help with his stuttering and behavior. He was raised in Dublin, Michigan, and graduated from Kaliva Norman Dixon High School. Jones attended the University of Michigan, studying pre-med on an ROTC scholarship. In 1953, Jones served as a lieutenant in the Army during the Korean conflict. He was also trained as an Army Ranger, never to be confused with a park ranger. After leaving the military, Jones studied acting at the American Theater Wing in New York. He also finished his degree at the University of Michigan in 1955. Jones began working on television, and his first film was as Lieutenant Luther Zog in Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, 1964. He worked extensively, but his next significant role was boxer Jack Jeffries in The Great White Hope, 1970. He was in the Baseball Negro League show The Bingo Long, Traveling All-Stars, and Motor Kings, 1976, Swashbuckler, 1976, with Robert Shaw, The Greatest, 1977, and then Star Wars, 1977, as the voice of Darth Vader. Other movies include the comedy, the last remake of Bo Jess, 1977, my favorite role of his, Thulsa Doom in Conan the Barbarian, 1982, all that other Star Wars stuff, whatever they're calling it, Soul Man, 1986, Gardens of Stone, 1987, Mate One, 1987, The Great Coming to America, 1988, Field of Dreams, 1989, Best of the Best, 1989, The Hunt for Red October, 1990, a television movie that was so good I have to include it, By Dawn's Early Light, 1990, The Sandlot, 1993, Clear and Present Danger, 1994, The Lion King, 1994, again creating an iconic voice. He was also in two sequels, The Lion King, 2019, and Coming to America 2021. Jones won an Oscar for Best Actor in The Great White Hope 1970 and was given an honorary Oscar in 2012. He is also an EGOT, having won all four major awards. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The voice of Ray Kinsella, Kevin Costner, narrates over pictures of his father's life, telling he was of Irish descent, served in World War I, settled in Chicago, and was crushed by the Black Sox scandal in 1920. The father, John Kinsella, Dwyer Brown, played a little minor league baseball, moved to Brooklyn, married Ray's mother, and was an old man working at the shipyard by the time Ray was born in 1952. Ray's mother died when he was three, and his father raised him on tales of players like Shoeless Joe Jackson. Ray rioted against his father's beloved Yankees. The narration continues that the youth and his father fought until Ray left for Berkeley in California. As Ray continues his experiences in the 1960s, he meets Annie, Amy Madigan, who is from Iowa. And I met Annie. 
The only thing we had in common was that she came from Iowa, and I had once heard of Iowa. The couple married in 1974. Ray's father died later that year. The couple had their daughter, Karen, Gabby Hoffman, a few years later. They run a farm in Iowa. It all changes when Ray heard the voice. They live in a rural house completely surrounded by corn. Ray walks through the field as the sun sets. I am informed that Iowa's people spend vast amounts of time walking, drinking, fighting, and sleeping in their field. Ray hears a voice say, If you build it, he will come. Annie and Karen were on the porch and didn't hear a thing. The voice repeats, but only Ray can hear. Annie calls Ray inside for dinner. He tells Annie about the voice he heard in the cornfield. She takes it pretty well. That night as the couple is sleeping, Ray is woken by the voice repeating the phrase. In the morning, Karen is watching Harvey 1950, the movie where James Stewart can see a six-foot-tall invisible rabbit is on television. Ray turns the television off and says the man is sick. He plans on taking Karen to school, and Annie, like a good wife, asks him what to do if the voice calls while he's gone. Ray goes to the co-op and asks an old farmer if he's ever heard voices in the field. When they hear that Ray is hearing voices in the field, they all stare at him while Crazy by Patsy Cline plays in the background. Ray says he is hearing tractor noises and will oil the machine. He goes back to work in his field. The voice repeats the message and Ray starts yelling back. The words of the voice never change. Ray then sees a vision of a baseball field with lights near his house. There is a lone baseball player in the vision. When the player is shown in close-up, the player is shoeless Joe Jackson, Ray Liotta. At supper, Ray tells Annie that he believes he should build a baseball field. Annie is very skeptical and asks Ray if he is having an LSD flashback. He says he never took any. The couple talks about Shoeless Joe Jackson dying in 1951. Shoeless Joe was banned for life following the Black Sox scandal. Ray confesses that he has issues with becoming his father. He says he never forgave his father for getting old. Ray thinks this is his last chance to do something about his life. Annie gives him the okay to build the field. Crowds of onlookers watch Ray plow his corn. Ray rides Karen on the tractor and tells her stories of Shoeless Joe and other great players. Ray tells how the 1919 White Sox were paid by gamblers to throw the World Series. Shoeless Joe took the money, but played pretty well in the series. Some people see this as mitigation for his taking the payoff. A Chicago jury found Shoeless Joe and his teammates innocent in 1921. However, the commissioner of baseball, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, Banned all eight players for life, saying, regardless of the verdict of juries, no player that throws a baseball game, no player that undertakes or promises to throw a baseball game, no player that sits in conference with a bunch of crooked players and gamblers where the ways and means of throwing games are planned and discussed, and does not tell his club about it, will ever play professional baseball. This is also where the phrase, say it ain't so, Joe, originated. Ray, Annie, and Karen build the field with lights and bleachers. Ray continues the very positive and modified Shoeless Joe narrative to his family. Ray is distracted as he waits for something to happen in the field. The seasons pass and winter comes and goes without any action on the field. In the spring, Annie and Ray believe that they may just break even on the farm because the field has reduced the growing acreage. I have some issues here that I will discuss in the conclusion. Ray is short with Karen when she interrupts, but she finally says that someone is outside on the lawn. Ray looks at the field, and Shoeless Joe is standing there in the dark looking around. Annie sends Ray out to meet his hero. Ray turns the field lights on before heading out to meet the player. Shoeless Joe takes a fielder's position, and Ray tries to hit balls to him. He buffs it on the first try. Ray finally starts hitting. Shoeless Joe fields a few before trotting in. The two men introduce himself. Shoeless Joe is amazed looking at the bats and equipment. Joe says that being thrown out of baseball was like losing part of himself. Ray pitches balls for Shoeless Joe. Don't we need a catcher? Not if you get it near the plate, we don't. Shoeless Joe sends a lot of balls into the cornfield. Finally, Shoeless Joe reminisces about the game and the smell. Annie and Karen come down to the field. Shoeless Joe comments on the lights and how owners make baseball a business and not a game. Shoeless Joe can't leave the boundaries of the ball field. 
Karen asks if Shoeless Joe is a ghost. As he begins to leave, he asks if he can return. Gray says yes, and that he built this field for him, for Shoeless Joe. Shoeless Joe asks if this is heaven, and Ray says no, it's Iowa. Shoeless Joe disappears into the corn. Annie's brother Mark, Timothy Busfield, tells the couple that they will lose their farm if they keep the ball field. Mark makes an offer to Ray and Annie to buy the farm before it is foreclosed. Karen arrives and tells Ray that the baseball game is on. The eight banned White Sox slash Black Sox players come out of the corn and begin playing baseball like a bunch of kids. Ray and Karen sit in the bleachers and watch the game. Mark, his wife, Annie, and their mother come out to the field. Only Ray, Annie, and Karen can see the players. The in-laws think Ray has gone nuts. The players visit regularly, and Ray bonds with the men. At the end of each practice, they fade into the cornfield. One evening, Ray hears the voice say, Ease his pain. Ray doesn't understand it, and is very frustrated. Ray contemplates the new message while he and Annie go to a PTA meeting about banning books. One of the books being discussed for banning is a book by Terrence Mann, James Earl Jones. The crowd is saying the book is porno and he is a communist. Ray starts to get the idea that he must see Terrence. Finally, Annie can't take it anymore and rages on the book burners. And I think if you had experienced even a little bit of the 60s, you might feel the same way too. I experienced the 60s. No, I think you had two 50s and moved right on into the 70s. The lady attacks Ray for building a baseball field. Annie says she is a Nazi book-burning cow. At least he is not a book-burner, you Nazi cow. As Annie is enjoying her victory, Ray hauls her out so he can continue his quest. Ray has to undertake research because he doesn't know of any connection between the author and baseball. Terrence is making software for children. Ray's evidence is that one of Terrence's characters is named John Kinsella, his father's name. Terrence has also had an interview about his love of baseball. In the interview, Terrence said he wanted to play for the Dodgers when they were in Brooklyn. Ray tells Annie that he has to take Terrence to Fenway Park. She reveals that she dreamed that Ray was at the game with Terrence. Is Fenway the one with the big green wall in left field? Yeah. I dreamt last night you were at Fenway with Terrence Mann. Ray says he had the same dream. Annie helps him pack. Ray drives his Volkswagen microbus to Boston. He ends up in a very Jewish neighborhood and finally finds Terrence's apartment. Terrence opens the door with a, Who the hell are you? He slams the door in Ray's face. Ray knocks again and Terrence says he has no answers for him. Finally, Terrence grants Ray one minute. Terrence says to Ray, You're from the 60s. And he chases him out with a bug sprayer. You once wrote, There comes a time when all the cosmic tumblers have clicked into place and the universe opens itself up for a few seconds to show you what's possible. Oh my God. What? You're from the 60s. Well, you actually... Ow, oh, hey! Back to the 60s. Wait back. a second. There's no place for you here Just... in the future. Get back while you still can! Ray goes back inside and pretends to have a gun under his jacket in the best film noir fashion. Terrence pulls a crowbar to defend himself until Ray shouts that he is a pacifist. Ray says he is kidnapping Terrence for a single baseball game. Terrence denies saying that he wanted to play baseball. Finally, he decides to go to the baseball game with Ray. Terrence wants to be left alone and has lost faith in all causes. The pair sit in the stand and watch the game. Ray hears the voice say, go the distance. On the scoreboard, stats for Archibald Moonlight Graham appear. Says he is from Chisholm, Minnesota, played one game for the New York Giants in 1922, and had zero at-bats. Terrence sits stone-faced and unmoved. Since Terrence didn't hear or see anything, Ray agrees to drive him home. As Ray drops Terrence off, Ray says the message he saw was, The man has done enough. Leave him alone. Terrence stops Ray from driving away and says, Moonlight Graham. Ray asks what the message means, and Terrence says they are going to Minnesota to find Graham. The pair take the microbus to Minnesota. Ray calls Annie and tells her the plans. After she hangs up, 
Her brother Mark and his partners are there about buying the farm before it is foreclosed. When they get to Chisholm, Ray gets to work looking for Archie Moonlight Graham. Terrence takes Ray to the local newspaper, where the publisher, Ann Seymour, tells him they are probably looking for Doc. Graham had a short baseball career and then went to school to become a doctor. We're looking for an ex-baseball player named Archibald Graham. Oh, you mean Doc Graham? No, I think his nickname was Moonlight. Well, that's Dr. Graham. Dr. Graham. His uh, baseball career never amounted to much, so he went back to school. Doc Graham is dead. He died in 1972. Sadly, the publisher said that Graham died in 1972. She then reads about Graham aiding the poor or needy as he worked for decades in the town. Terrence thinks something is missing from the story. He interviews people in town that knew the doctor. Graham was devoted to his wife. Terrence could not find any bad habits that Graham had. That night, Ray reads in the paper that Terrence's father thinks he is missing. Ray goes for a walk through the quiet town. Suddenly, the town goes back to 1972. There are Nixon posters and The Godfather 1972 is showing at the theater. Ray sees Dr. Graham, Burt Lancaster, strolling through the town carrying his customary umbrella. Dr. Graham confirms that he is Moonlight, but no one has called him that for 50 years. The two walk together and Moonlight explains that it was the last day of the season and his team was way ahead. The coach put him in the game. No balls were hit to him and he never got a chance to bat. I'd been up with the club about, uh, oh, about three weeks, but I hadn't seen any action. Suddenly, old John McGraw points a bony finger in my direction and he says, right field. Did you get to make a play? I never hit the ball out of the infield. Game ended, the season was over. Since he didn't want to return to the minors, he gave up baseball. Finally, Ray asked Moonlight what it would be if he had a wish. Moonlight says he wants one major league at bat and to wink at the pitcher during the windup. Well, you know, I... I never got to bat in the major leagues. I'd have liked to have that chance just once. To stare down a big league pitcher. To stare him down and just as he goes into his windup, wink. Make him think you know something he does. Ray asks Moonlight if he wants to go to the field, but Moonlight says that his work as a doctor was too important. Ray tells Terrence what happened with Moonlight and they decide to leave town the next day without Moonlight. Ray gets a message to call Annie, and she has to tell him that the note on the farm has been sold to her brother Mark and his firm. Outside of town, Ray and Terrence pick up a hitchhiker. The young man says he is a ball player and introduces himself as Archie Graham, Frank Whaley. I'm looking for a place to play. I heard that all through the Midwest, they have towns with teams. And in some places, well, they'll even find you a day job so you can play ball nights and weekends. Well, this is your lucky day, kid. We're going someplace kind of like that. All right. I'm Ray Kinsella. This is Terrence Mann. Hi. I'm Archie Graham. Terrence asks about Ray's father and is told that he stopped playing catch with his father at the age of 14. Ray said it happened after he read Terrence's book. Ray told his father he could never respect a man who had a criminal Shoeless Joe Jackson is a hero. As the three return to Iowa, Terrence can see the lights on the field burning. Annie and Karen come to greet the men. The number of ghost baseball players on the field has more than doubled. Shoeless Joe welcomes Ray back. Moonlight is awed by the famous players on the field. Shoeless Joe says they wouldn't let Ty Cobb come because they couldn't stand him when they were alive. The Ty Cobb wanted to play. None of us could stand a son of a bitch when we were alive, so we told him to stick it. <laughs> he then invites Moonlight onto the field to play baseball. Moonlight finally gets to bat. He winks at the pitcher during the windup, and the pitcher throws one at his ear. The pitcher then throws the second one at his ear. Shoeless Joe tells Moonlight the first two pitches have been high and tight, so look for low and away. Also, watch out for in your ear. All right, those first two were high and tight. So what do you think the next one's going to be? Well, either loan away or in my ear. He's not going to want to load the bases, so look for low and away. Right. But watch out for in your ear. Moonlight hits a sacrifice to center field and gets credited with an RBI. One day, Mark shows up while the players are on the field. He starts telling Ray he needs to give up the field. 
Mark doesn't believe that Terrence is a famous author. Mark says if Ray sells, they will leave the house and Ray and his family can live there rent free. Karen, who is eating a hot dog, says they don't have to sell the farm. Mark tells Karen to be quiet. She says people from all over the world will come to see the field and give the family money. Karen continues that it will be like old times. Mark gives Ray the foreclosure papers. Terrence says people will come, longing for the past and paying for the privilege. Terrence and Mark take the roles of an angel and a devil on Ray's shoulder. Ray, people will come, Ray. Ray, when the bank opens in the morning, they'll foreclose. People will come, Ray. You're broke, Ray. You sell now or you lose everything. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. But baseball has marked the time. Ray refuses to sell. Mark goes to pick up Karen, his niece, and Ray goes for his daughter. She falls off the bleachers and stops breathing. Annie begins to go for help, but Ray stops her. Moonlight runs to the edge of the field. He pauses before stepping off the field. When he does, he turns from Moonlight the baseball player to Doc Graham. Doc easily saves Karen's life. Ray realizes that Doc can't go back to be a ball player. As Doc leaves, the ghost players all treat him with respect. Mark asks, when did these baseball players get here? When did these ball players get here? Sheila Show tells Doc that he is good. Mark says, Do not sell this farm, Ray. You have to keep this farm. Do not sell this farm, Ray. You gotta keep this farm. <laughs> the players begin to leave for the day. Shoeless Joe asks if he wants to come with them. Ray thinks he is being asked, but the invitation is only for Terrence. Ray gets a little upset and wonders why he did all of this. Wait a second. Wait a second. Why him? I built this field. You wouldn't be here Ray, if it weren't for me. Well, sick. you wouldn't be here I'm if it weren't for You have a family. I know, but I want to know what's out there. I want to see it. But you're not invited. No, wait. I have done everything I've been asked to do. I didn't understand it, but I've done it. And I haven't once asked what's in it for me. What are you saying, Ray? I'm saying what's in it for me. Terrence tells Ray he has to stay behind with his family. Terrence goes into the corn. He giggles as he enters. Sheila's Joe is still standing on the field. He says, if you build it, he will come. What are you grinning at, you ghost? If you build it, he will come. He nods towards the home plate where a catcher is taking off his gear. It is Ray's father as a young man full of life and dreams. John Kinsella thanks his son Ray for building the field. Ray introduces Annie and Karen. Annie and Karen leave the men at the field. They walk and talk. John thinks the baseball field is heaven. Is this heaven? It's Iowa. Ray asks John to play a game of catch. Ray calls the man dad, and they both tear up as they play ball. Hey, dad? You want to have a catch? I'd like that. A long line of cars can be seen winding their way towards the field. I cry. Conclusions. There's an unconfirmed report that Amy Madigan's husband, Ed Harris, was the voice in the field. I couldn't tell from listening. It has also been stated that Ben Affleck and Matt Damon were in attendance of the game at Fenway Park when the film was shot there. As good as Costner, Madigan, and the others are, Burt Lancaster and James Earl Jones are the heart and soul of this film. They represent two extremes of American society that are tied together through baseball. Both men are good and are excellent role models. I looked it up and a major league field without stands and facilities averages around 4.5 acres. So, for math's sake, let's say 5 acres. Ray said the land was worth $2,200. That comes to 11000 in total. In 1987, an acre of corn sold for at most $235, or $1,175 for the five acres. Then you must subtract the seed, water, fertilizer, equipment, and time. It seems like Ray could have saved money by not growing corn. I know farming is hard, but this is awful close to the edge. Finally, 
Shoeless Joe brought the extra players to the field, saying they wouldn't let Ty Cobb come because they couldn't stand him when they were alive. I've always heard that Ty Cobb was mean and sharpened his spikes to hurt other players. The legend also said he was racist and once killed a black man in a dispute. Current research says these rumors are false and came from a single source. Also, there are letters to the baseball commissioner by Cobb asking that cleats be checked for dullness prior to games. World famous short summary. Listen to the voice and happy Father's Day. This show is now completely free and independent, brought to you without ads. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave a review where you get your podcast. It really helps the show get found. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at ClassicMovieRev.com. There is also a lot of other information there, especially about film noir. Beware the Moors.